This is Delhi. Please stand by for our next program. This is All India Radio. Dear listeners, we are starting for you a new bi-monthly program series on traditional Indian knowledge systems, power of listening. The series will touch upon the rich legacy of science, mathematics and technological practices in ancient and medieval India that serve as a bedrock in shaping our present. It is an attempt on our part to reintroduce you to this rich repository of the traditional Indian knowledge system, a series that takes you on a journey to our glorious past and its mesmerizing immortal treasures. Let's relive them. Let's enjoy power of listening. In today's episode, we will be talking about the magnificent world of our traditional Indian chemistry. Stay tuned. Science is behind everything on our Mother Earth. Curiosity in the form of what, why, how about nature, the human body and different activities in our daily life are deeply rooted to science. Our country has been nurturing science for a long, long time. We've had a glorious past in science and technology. This was a land of sages, scholars and scientists. India's scientific legacy has always inspired the world. In any early civilization, metallurgy was a central activity, whether it was during the Bronze Age or the Iron Age. The Indus Valley civilization was one of the earliest human societies and the story of our ancient chemistry begins from here. Ayurveda used a variety of minerals which has also shaped chemistry in ancient times. In ancient India, chemistry was called Rasayan Shastra, Rasatantra, Rasakriya or Rasavidya. But first of all, what is the need to revisit the world of ancient Indian chemistry? Dr. Sunita Malhotra, Professor of Chemistry, has an answer to our question. Chemistry is a science central to many sciences. Chemistry was a major landmark of science in ancient India and the archaeological surveys and findings and evidences tell us that there was a well-developed urban system of public baths, streets, granaries, temples, houses and all of these were made of burnt bricks or the baked bricks. There was a mass production of the pottery and even they had a script of their own for communication and all this involved a lot of chemistry behind it. Pottery making in that era was really excellent and it carried a lot of chemistry and the chemical processes along with that because these materials were prepared by mixing, firing and molding to create pots of desired shapes sizes and colors and you must have heard about terracotta craft. This was very famous craft of that time and it was practiced in Harappan culture and also the Harappan figurines. They were entirely hand molded which speaks of their achievements or perfections in the terracotta craft. And you will also be surprised to know that in Mohanjo-Daro city especially, gypsum cement which we talk about even today, lime and traces of calcium carbonate were mixed with sand to make even a construction of a well they were using. They made a well by mixing all these constituents and still at many of the places even now this is the process of making such uh, structures. The chemical analysis of uh, various samples which were available from there that is Mohanjadano they tell that they are made up of gypsum, lime and sand. So you can think of how advanced our chemistry was even at that stage. When Dr. Malhotra was discussing about the city of Mohenjo-daro, there were many thoughts moving through my mind. Long ago, I read in a book, Harappans made a prototype of glass called Fayans, 
which was used for ornaments. They forged and smelted a number of objects made of metals such as lead, copper, silver and gold. In this way, they improved the hardness of copper for making artifacts by using tin and arsenic. The archaeological evidences reveal that Indus Valley residents had access to copper and gold mining and many tools were made, many weapons were made from copper and bronze but not iron. Copper was also a central metal I would say from that many alloys such as bronze was made and the earliest swords which date back to 2300 BC that is 2300 BC. They were also made from copper and they have been made available by excavation at the Ganga Jamuna Doab region of our country. The archaeologists, one of the famous ones is R. D. Banerjee and the other one is Sir John Marshall. They did research on Indian culture and civilization and they have unearthed Mohanjodaro and Harappan sites. And they reveal that Indus Valley people were using minerals for ornamental purposes, cosmetic purposes and also for the medicinal purposes which is again one of the very important areas of our ancient chemistry. Many, many sorts of metals were used for the medicinal purposes. Artisans of Harappan period were well versed with different minerals and their best use of making artifacts. They had very good knowledge of chemical substances found in nature. In Harappan excavations, many such substances and minerals have been found. Lapis lazuli was a beautiful blue stone, which is mainly a silicate. Artisans of that time stained deep blue by the presence of other minerals. Turquoise was used as a gem, which is the hydrous phosphate of aluminium and copper. Amethyst was a quartz or aluminium oxide used as a semi-precious stone by the Harappan people. Along with artisans, metalsmiths were also active and proficient at that time. They used an alloy of copper and arsenic in place of low-grade bronze. Harappan metalsmiths used crude copper with considerable sulphur content for casting plain objects and refined copper for shaping it into the desired types of vessels. A number of metal ingots and castings have been found on the sites of Mohinjadaro and Lothal. These metal ingots were transported and made available to the workers for refining. Harappan culture was also advanced in the technique of metalworking. Rigveda describes that the tanning of leather and dyeing of cotton were practiced during the Vedic period. During 1000 to 400 BC, they made a particular kind of polished grey pottery known as painted grey ware. Attractive black polished ware also belongs to the Vedic period and its amazing golden gloss could never be replicated. It is still a chemical mystery. These wonderful wares indicate that chemical practitioners of the Vedic period had mastery in controlling the kiln temperatures. During the Vedic period, Indians had a very sound knowledge of natural laws and their metal derivatives. They developed a number of products out of those which were useful in their daily lives. Let us know more about it. Possibly the ores of metals were smelted in small furnaces. And the general term which was used for a metal is ayas. Ayas means Still, if you know, in Hindi, there is a word for metals and uh, minerals, we say ayask. Ayask is the Hindi word from where we say that metal has been extracted. The ore is actually called ayask. So, that ayask comes from there and it means that any metal and the metals which were there in that era were copper, bronze or lead. So, these were the metals which are commonly known as by the common or general name as ayas. And there is much evidence now known to us that people of that culture also used gold ornaments. So that means gold was also known to them. The metal workers 
of that period has very technical knowledge excellent knowledge about the copper and bronze production for various uh, things of utility which were used in domestic utensils and these utensils were also used for several rituals as well they were also made up of metals at different excavation sites a number of iron objects have been discovered which are associated with the grey ware painted ceramic pottery we just refer to pottery initially and ceramics also and these were specialized kind of painted grey ware ceramics the occurrence of iron in painted uh, grey ware ceramic was first reported at alamgirpur on hindan river in meerut district and hastinapur also it was found it was the earliest evidence we found is at that place where smelting and use of iron have been reported and if you wish to know that what kind of things they were making from these metals a barbed or socketed arrowhead a chisel a bracelet with unconnected ends were few iron objects which were also discovered at that end and in ropar punjab iron made objects like nails hooks bars pikes knives daggers sickles spear heads i mean you can just go on counting there is no end to it which was being used and some of these are still being similar instruments or apparatus if you want to wish to say that similar objects are still being used for very very utilitarian purposes and also in nashik which is in maharashtra leaf shaped arrowheads caltrops choppers knife blades axes drills chisels nails and what not they have been found in archaeological excavation in the 5th century bc greek historian herodotus has mentioned that indians in the persian army used keir arrows tipped with iron roman author natural philosopher and army commander of the early roman empire pliny has referred to swords of good quality made of indian steel the romans were fascinated by the indian steel which they imported to produce fancy cutleries and armors such facts illustrate that by the 5th or 4th century bc the indian metal workers had attained a high degree of perfection in the techniques of producing iron and steel development of colors was a big achievement of our ancient indian chemists Ajanta and Elora caves are mute witness to this. How do we look at the chemistry of colors used by the ancient Indians? We are using inks in our daily life for a variety of purposes. The use of ink is well known and it dates back to 4th century BC from the excavations seen at Takshila. The famous book Ras Ratnakara written by the Indian alchemist Nagarjuna provides us the recipe for the ink preparation the ink was prepared from the nuts and myrobalans and it was using a different combination of plants resins and other materials and you must be aware of the paintings which have been done at ajanta and elora and they have also used many types of colors and inks and use of chalk and bread lead etc have been also there in those times and even after a thousand years these paintings are still looking unfaded they look so fresh and from that even you can appreciate how advanced or expertise was there in those days also with the use of inks and colors and not even the paintings and ajanta and elora there are other places also where such paintings and use of colors are there the ancient indians were proficient in glass making and developing glass products through archaeological excavations we found evidences of such glass products from many sites in our country it was one of the most prominent chemical products if you say about uh, post vedic era glass was really fascinating and glass if you know is not a single compound it is a solid fused mixture of lime alkali sand and certain metallic oxide and the role of metallic oxides is to give a color 
when we say different kinds of colors of glass or different varieties of uh, glass are made we are very well aware now that there is many varieties of glass called soda glass borosilicate glass even at that time these coloring agents were used and evidences of glass slag and glazing were found at hastinapur takshila nalanda nasik nivasa kolapur maheswar there are so many sites ujjain punnar so the glass work was done for an extensive uh, you can say as a craft in an extensive way many many places were doing this uh, skill and evidences of glassware have been found in 30 sites in india the glass objects like beads bangles earrings eye birds these were unearthed of that time which were made at that time and it was really wonderful to know that at that time also the colored glass was in use and the colors which they used for making this glass were varying to a wide variety you name any color it was there glass ranging from blue glass green red white yellow orange purple very very fascinating and attractive objects were made which have been found and uh, we are really surprised at how these people were able to have such a good craftsmanship and uh, real chemistry behind that During the post-Vedic period, colorful glass products were excavated from around 30 sites. Beads of black and brownish color were found at Hastinapur. It belonged to 800 BC, having mainly a soda-lime silicate composition with traces of phosphates and potassium, and their color is due to the varying amounts of iron compounds in them. Excavations at Ujjain have brought forth some beads ear reels and bangles these glass products belong to 500 to 200 bc and those at maheshwar a black glass seal depicts an elephant in a lively posture and ear reels of amber color these are of 400 bc vintage at the nashik site 200 bc old ear reels gold foil beads and rings were found a large number of glass objects of the 3rd century bc have been observed in the basti district of uttar pradesh during post vedic times indian chemists had developed paper washing material soap cosmetics they also contributed to perfumery such were some notable contributions of our indian chemists if you compare your daily needs today and what was available at that time also many many similarities and majority of the things which you use now even today those people were also using that if we start with paper you are also using it they were also using it it was there in 7th century time also paper was known to them and paper making was practiced all over the country in places like murshidabad mysore ahmedabad zafarabad evidences have been found for it and for washing clothes people still use reetha and shikakai that was also known to those people they were also using it and in gujarat the oil of iranda seeds of the plant mahua and impure uh, sort of calcium carbonate was used for washing clothes but gradually even at that time soft soaps were introduced they learned how to make soft soaps even now we are using so- soft soaps and in again referring to ramira's brit samita there was a reference of perfumes and cosmetics these are very commonly used now also and in bover script even the recipe for hair dye was there and what about uh, their constituents even hair for coloring hair now we are using as indigo as one of the constituents and indigo was used at that time also and some minerals were also used such as iron powder or black iron or certain acidic extracts of sour rice gruel were used so they used to make hair dyes for dyeing the hair by using these constituents and even in your herbal preparations still indigo is used as one of the constituent to make the color a little darker for the hair and if you say about gandha yukti this was uh, really the art of making perfumes uh, and again in uh, one of the sections in 
वरा मेरा बृहत संहिता इट इज फॉर्मिंग वन चैप्टर सॉर्ट ऑफ ए थिंग विच इज नोन एज गंधा युक्ति दैट मीन्स द रेसिपीज फॉर मेकिंग सेंट्स विच वर यूज फॉर डिफरेंट पर्पजेज इवन सेंट्स फॉर माउथ सेंट्स फॉर टेकिंग बाथ बाथ पाउडर्स इंसेंसेज एंड टेलकम पाउडर सो गंधा युक्ति गिवस यू वेरी वेरी डिटेल प्रोसीजर्स एंड कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट्स फॉर मेकिंग दिस परफ्यूम्स एंड सेंट्स Gandha Yukti the art of making perfumes one of the sections in Varaha Mehra's Brihat Samhita is on making perfumes this is known as Gandha Yukti or the art of making perfumes Gandha Yukti details several perfumeries such as scented water for bathing scented oils for body and hair massage perfumes deodorants scents as mouth fresheners and scented tooth sticks Shlokas 13, 14, 29 and 30 of Gandha Yukti tell us about the raw materials that were used to obtain perfumes in ancient India. Apart from paper, soap, cosmetics and perfumery, the discovery of saltpeter, potassium nitrate and its major application in gunpowder was a turning point in the history of chemistry. Firearms are mentioned in ancient Indian treatises like Rigveda, Atharvaveda, Arthashastra and Manusmriti. Rasopanishad precisely describes the preparations of a gunpowder mixture. Tamil texts also explain the preparation of fireworks using sulfur, charcoal, saltpeter, mercury, arsenic and camphor. Guns and gunpowder are also mentioned in Shukracharya's Shukra Niti Sar. Similar to ancient times, India had achieved a lot in chemistry and chemical practices even during the medieval period. There are a number of contributions made in this particular domain by Indians. lots and lots of achievements in the medieval period and uh, one of the fascinations was to make gold and second was elixir of life i mean how to live long and uh, the indian uh, alchemy or the ras vidya which was called these texts show a number of organic and inorganic substances which were used and these rasas or minerals these were again divided into uprasas or maharasas that means a smaller version or the greater version of that in fact mercury got the attention the most it was treated as a king of the metals why because it was heavy in weight fluid again and its combining capacity with other elements or substances that is also very excellent it readily reacts or combines giving you different products so all these processes were being tried and lot of lot of information about processes and products was gathered in that time and uh, you will be surprised to know that there were ras shalas if we talk about the laboratories like the ones we have today also there were chemistry laboratories called ras shalas that means a place where alchemists were used to work and uh, design such processes and products and very very great uh, designs i would say in that and in ras ratna samukhya which was a sanskrit uh, treatise i would share that uh, there was a complete design and direction that how a laboratory will be built so well designed well laid laboratories for different operations were there and about the instruments or the yantras which they called used in the laboratories lot and lot of variety for the processes which we are using even in chemistry today distillation sedimentation filtration purification and heating simple heating and so many processes are being used in chemistry alchemy was at its zenith in ancient india there were many prominent alchemists those days who had contributed a lot to strengthen this specific area let's hear more from dr sunita malhotra one of them is kanad he was a sage and an alchemist 
who lived in India in 6th century BC. He was born in the Prabhas Khetra near Dwarka of Gujarat. You must be knowing of the atomic theory which has been taught in many books by the name of John Dalton. But actually, this dates back to the Indian ancient chemistry where Rishi Kanad told about the atomic theory and he proposed that atom is indivisible. He was the one who gave this idea about the atoms or the Parmanu we called. And Kanad also told us that there are different types of atoms for different types of substances. So, the indivisibility of atom, atom as a constituent of all the matter on the earth, that was the idea given by the Khanad in our ancient chemistry which is dating back to 6th century BC. And the contribution was great at that time and even today. Nagarjuna was another great Indian metallurgist and alchemist. He was born in Gujarat in 931 AD and has expertise in transmuting base metals into metals looking like gold. The Arabs learned this technique from him and later called this as alchemy. The most famous work of Nagarjuna was Ras Ratnakara, which deals with the formulation of rasas or mercury compounds. He has also discussed various methods for the extraction of metals like gold, silver, tin and copper and a great account of our ancient chemistry and about these scientists or alchemists has been written by Professor P. C. Ray who has written two volumes of a book called A History of Hindu Chemistry from the earliest times to the middle of the 16th century AD. Very illustrative and vast description of all the works majority of the works which were carried out in ancient India in those times. In Western countries, chemistry was placed on a solid foundation only in the 18th century. In short, we can say that contributions made by Indian chemists for chemistry and chemical practices in ancient and medieval India are par excellence. The achievements of Indians in this field are outstanding. We must feel proud to have such a great legacy pertaining to chemistry in our country. We conclude with heartfelt thanks to Professor Sunita Malhotra for sparing time for the sake of our listeners. Continuing our attempt to revisit our rich legacy, we shall be back with the next episode with some more interesting and fascinating aspects of traditional Indian knowledge systems. Do join us on this enlightening journey. Bye for now. Power of Listening You heard the first episode of our all-new series on traditional Indian knowledge systems, Power of Listening. We hope you enjoyed it. We will be back on the second Friday of next month, that is, the 10th of September, same time with another episode, taking you on a journey through our glorious traditional Indian knowledge system. This program was scripted by Dr. Manish Mohan Gore and the expert on the show was Dr. Sunita Malhotra. The narration was rendered by Manoj Mayankar. Additional voicing was done by Kiran Mishra. Special thanks to Randhir Thakur and Amol Path for their contribution. This series has been conceptualized by Shashi Shekhar Vempati, CEO Prasad Bharati and produced by Vinod Kumar. The episode is also available on our official YouTube channel, Akashwani AIR. Be there on the 10th of September, same time, same frequencies. Bye for now.